Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Rare Book Room. Um, the Strand has been loving books for 89 years. I find it one of the sacred places in New York. My name is Elizabeth Howard and I'm here this evening representing Woven. We oppose violence everywhere now. It's a, Woven is a digital platform that brings together individuals, institutions, and organizations that are working to end violence in our lifetime. Woven was started by Diana Weggie, an artist, environmentalist, and philanthropist. Diana is here. I hope you'll have a chance to meet her after the program. Why, we ask ourselves, does violence, hatred, injustice, lack of empathy seem to increase? Can we ever find a new way out, or will nothing change? When I was asked to open this program, I immediately went to my shelf and pulled down the fire next time. I've been reading and rereading it as I've been reading the fire this time. In, I recall a passage in Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, which was in one of James Baldwin's later novels written in 19, or published in 1968. The young protagonist, Leo, describes vividly being blinded by the lights of a police cruiser forced up against a wall and patted down as he's walking home with his older brother after just being out on a night in Harlem 48 years ago. That question again, can we ever find a new way forward or will nothing ever change? I want to thank the editor, Jasmine Ward, for gathering the reflections on race from a new generation in this thoughtful book and guiding us at the same time back to the wisdom and extraordinary language of James Baldwin. Thank you too to the many contributors of this book, those who could join us this evening and those who couldn't be here. Your voices are being heard. Finally, I want to thank Sean King for moderating. We're glad to have him at the Strand. So now I hope you will join me in warmly welcoming Sean. Hello. So good to be here with you all and uh, so good to, to see the crowd. And uh, I, have, I have a little bit of a joke just to get us started. It's a joke about how gifted these writers are and it's also a bit of a joke about my ego. So I've only been in, in New York for like 10 days and I moved up here from Atlanta. And I saw my literary agent, Mink, in the back row when I came in. And so immediately, being who I am, I thought Mink was here to see me. <laughs> and I, like I really did. And so I came up to Mink and uh, she, she said, uh, well, why are you here? <laughs> and I thought, I thought we were having like a fun, a fun thing and I was like well you know I'm, I'm moderating and she's like no really why are you and I, so it, it, it took me a good 20 seconds to realize that uh, my, my agent is just uh, woke and righteous and was here for, for reasons that had nothing to do with me uh, which is good which is good but uh, but I, I won't make that same mistake and so uh, you all are here really for the same reason that I am here to um, to learn from these great thinkers. And I, I've learned that uh, every great writer is not necessarily a great thinker. Um, <laughs> these are great thinkers who are also amazing writers, who uh, in this piece by Jasmine Ward, and if you have not yet purchased it, uh, I hope you do. Um, she has assembled uh, some amazing, timely essays that on some level pain me to be so accurate, so reminiscent of the problems that this country has experienced for decades. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, I, got, I don't know if anybody was, if you've been watching the Olympics. I, I was watching the Olympics maybe two days ago, and they started doing this mini documentary 
on a Brazilian basketball star named Oscar Schmidt. And it was, was powerful. Uh, Oscar Schmidt, he had actually helped run in the, the torch. I had no idea, but Oscar Schmidt was actually one of the best basketball players of all time. Some people say he's the best basketball player to have never played in the NBA. And when he played for the Brazilian national team, the Brazilian national team several times beat the U.S. national team. And it was actually because of Oscar Schmidt that they decided to create the dream team in 1992. Like, I had no idea that all of this took place. He actually got drafted by the New Jersey Nets, but they had rules in place that said you can only, at the time, you can only play professionally or play for your national team. And he decided to play for his national team. And so because there was no social media back then, most of us today, and because of the way media works, most of us now have never even heard of him. Well, I, when I was reading uh, The Fire this time, and uh, like some of you who have read James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, I realized that a lot of us had no idea how huge Baldwin's work was back then. Like in 1963, in 1964, 1965, that book, it's a 130 page book of really two essays where he kind of poured his heart and soul out, was a bestseller. It was one of the most talked about, discussed, debated books of the time here in New York and all around the world. And um, so much of what troubled and bothered him troubles and bothers us today. And many of the essays reflect that. Now, we're different. Our, our problems have nuance. Our, our issues are not a one-for-one -one parallel. But I hope you see some of that in the readings. And I want to introduce just a few of the, uh, the authors. They're going to come up and, uh, and read some selections. I'll have a few questions for them. And then we'll engage you and take some of your questions. And then at the very end, for those of you who have it, if you'd like for them to, uh, to sign your copy, if you'd like to take photos or anything like that, um, they'll be available. But Garnet and Mitchell and Daniel and Emily are all award-winning writers, uh, highly acclaimed, brilliant thinkers. Uh, Google their names. Now don't, here's the thing, if you Google my name, it's what you will get in return may be very, very weird. <laughs> All right, not only because there's a football player who spells his name, a retired football player, and he and I, we don't like each other, and it's really weird, and he gets a lot of hate mail because our names are spelled the same, and, and so he blocked me, and then I blocked him, and it's, but beyond that, if you just Google my name, there's like tons of hate, and thankfully, that has not gotten to them yet, and I hope because I just said what I said, it doesn't start. But if you Google their names, which I encourage you to do, you will see so much brilliance. Uh, they're not just thinkers and writers. Each of them are also teachers and instructors and mentors uh, who have found ways to uh, not just be brilliant all by themselves, but to bring people along with them. And so uh, Garnet's going to come up and read a piece, then Mitchell, then Daniel, then Emily. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from an essay called Black and Blue, uh, which you heard a few renditions of earlier as in the song and it speaks about you know that mundane commonplace act walking it's a very simple thing to get it from one place to another but I try to capture the joys of walking yes but also some of the complications and perhaps even some of the tragedies of walking when you're of my complexion that that simple commonplace mundane act suddenly becomes this complex thing that you have to figure out ways to negotiate. So here's an excerpt. I keep breaking reading glasses. Thankfully this one survived. <laughs> 
One night in the East Village, I was running to dinner when a white man in front of me turned and punched me in the chest with such force that I thought my ribs had braided around my spine. I assumed he was drunk or had mistaken me for an old enemy, but found out soon enough that he'd merely assumed I was a criminal because of my race. When he discovered I wasn't what he imagined, he went on to tell me that his assault was my own fault for running up behind him. I blew up this incident as an aberration, but the mutual distrust between me and the police, that, that was impossible to ignore. It felt elemental. They'd enter a subway platform, I had noticed them. And I'd noticed all the other black men registering their presence as well, while just about everyone else remained oblivious to them. They'd glare, I'd get nervous and glance. They'd observe me steadily, I'd get uneasy. I'd observe them back, worrying that I looked suspicious. Their, suspicious. their suspicions would increase, and we'd continue the silent, uneasy dialogue until the subway arrived and separated us at last. I returned to the old rules I'd set for myself in New Orleans with elaboration. No running, especially at night. No sudden movements, no hoodies, no objects, especially shiny ones, in hand. No waiting for friends on street corners, lest I be mistaken for a drug dealer. No standing near a corner on a cell phone, for the same reason. As comfort set in, though, inevitably, I began to break some of those rules, until a night encounter sent me zealously back to them, having learned that anything less than vigilance was carelessness. After sumptuous Italian dinner and drinks with friends, I was jogging to the subway at Columbus Circle. I was running late to meet another set of friends at a concert downtown. I see a few friends here there. They'll recognize me saying running late sounds all too familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I heard someone shouting and I looked up to see a police officer approaching with his gun trained on me. Against the car! In no time, half a dozen cops were upon me, chucking me against the car and tightly handcuffing me. Why were you running? Where are you going? Where are you coming from? I said, why were you running? Since I couldn't answer everyone at once, I decided to respond first to the one who looked most likely to hit me. I was surrounded by a swarm and tried to focus on just one without inadvertently aggravating the others. It didn't work. As I answered that one, the others got frustrated that I wasn't answering them fast enough and barked at me. One of them, digging through my already emptied pockets, asked if I had any weapons. The question, more an accusation. Another badgered me about where I was coming from, as if on the 15th round, I decided to tell him the truth he imagined. Though I kept saying, calmly of course, which meant trying to manage a tone that ignored my racing heart and their spittle-filled shouts in my face, that I had just left friends two blocks down the road who were, yes sir, yes officer, of course officer, all still there and would vouch for me. To meet other friends whose text messages on my phone could verify that, but it made no difference. For a black man, to assert your dignity before the police was to risk assault. In fact, the dignity of black people meant less to them, which was why I always felt safer being stopped in front of white witnesses than black witnesses. The cops had less regard for the witnesses and entreaties of black onlookers, I found, whereas a concern of white witnesses usually, usually registered on them. A black witness asking a question or politely raising an objection could quickly become a fellow detainee. Difference to the police then was mandatory for a safe encounter. The cops ignored my explanations and my suggestions and continued to snarl at me. All except one of them, a captain. He had put his hand on my back and said to no one in particular, if he was running for a long time, he would have been sweating. He then instructed that the cops be removed. He told me that a black man had stabbed someone earlier two or three blocks away and they were searching for him. I noted that I had no blood in me 
and I told his fellow officers where I'd been and, and how to check my alibi. Unaware that there was even an alibi, as no one told me why I was being held. And of course, I hadn't dared ask. From what I'd seen, anything, anything beyond passivity would be interpreted as aggression. The police captain said I could go. None of the cops who detained me, though, thought an apology was necessary. Like the thug who punched me in the East Village, they seemed to think it was my own fault for running. Humiliated, I tried not to make eye contact with the onlookers on the sidewalk. And I was reluctant to pass them to be on my way. The captain, maybe noticing my shame, offered to give me a ride to the subway station. When he dropped me off and I thanked him for his help, he said, it's because you were polite that we let you go. If you were acting up, it would have been different. I realized that what I least liked about walking in New York City wasn't merely having to learn new rules of navigation and socialization. I mean, every city has its own. It was the arbitrariness of the circumstances that required them. An arbitrariness that made me feel like a child again, that infantilized me. When we first learn to walk, the world around us threatens to crash into us. Every step is risky. We train ourselves to walk without crashing by being attentive to our movements and extra attentive to the world around us. As adults, we walk without thinking, really. But as a black adult, I'm often returned to that moment in childhood when I'm just learning to walk. I'm once again on high alert, vigilant. Why y'all looking so serious? I know it's about race, but damn, come on, cheer up a little bit. It's cool, it's cool. Hey, haters the new love, man. You good. I'm looking for that. I want some hate mail too. Somebody send me some hate mail. <laughs> All right, so my essay is called Composite Pops. My name is Mitchell. How does a fatherless boy spell father? One answer is in the video of a poet who monologues about a dream in which he's the child contestant in a spelling bee. For the win, he has to spell the word father. He proceeds to spell the word M-O-T-H-E-R. Then when the spellmaster says, incorrect, he launches into a rant about absentee fathers and womanizing men and maternal strength ellipses. While plenty of mothers in the world deserve the most huge hurrahs, what I want to say to this poet and other like minds is this. No matter how much we lambast men and high note praise women, a woman maketh a father not. Yes, ours is indeed a revolutionary era of gender fluidness and sexual equality and girls doubtless need dads too. I repeat, girls need their dads. No way, no how, no day would I try to diminish or worse negate the role of a dad in his daughter's life. No one, and that includes humans, saints, and extraterrestrials, could convince me that my daughter's life would be better off without me in it. However, just as there are some aspects of being a female that my daughter's mother is more equipped to guide her through, there are aspects of being a male that I hope I have helped my son navigate in ways that only I could. This is my beating heart. Boys need fathers. Boys need fathers, period, exclamation point. And if a boy is not blessed with a father or gifted with a dynamic stand-in, then he must find ways to make one. He must identify the father-ish men in his life and find what he needs from them and compose one. It is an act of necessity, and I should know. My mother was not far along into her 19th year when she had me by a man who lived no more than a bike ride away but was absent for the first decade of life. To say I had no father, though, is a half-truth. To say my mother was my father would be a sentimental-ass lie. I had a father, and I had one because I made one. Or rather, I composed a father from the men at hand, brothers who kept me long before Obama made it a project. There was my mother's long-term boyfriend, Big Chris, 
my maternal grandfather Sam, my maternal uncle Anthony, my paternal uncle Henry, and at long last, my biological father Wesley. If you ask me to spell father, I could turn their names into one long ass portmanteau. Or I might just say, Pops. Pops was a group of men who provided a loving example of what it would soon enough mean to be a man. Pops nurtured me, bestowed me with his wisdom, pushed me to nuance the way I saw the world. He inspired me to dream. He tended my harms. He made sure I knew it was in me to surpass him. That's it. What's up, y'all? You having a good time? That's not that kind of event. Yeah, we're having a great time. <laughs> Sorry. I'm uh, really, really honored to be here. I'm honored more than I can say to be in this book. Um, first and foremost, because of these amazing people in it with me, and because of Jasmine, who's incredible, and, um, and then, of course, because of Baldwin, who is part of why I'm a writer and I think part of why I'm still alive in some ways. Um, so this is incredible, and thank you for being here. Um, this is a section from the middle of my essay. It's called This Far, Notes on Love and Revolution. I kind of hate open letters, but it is kind of an open letter uh, to my wife. It's really just a letter to my wife. I just happened to open it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to put you right in the middle of it. I spent my 20s with a healthy distrust of the word revolution. When I was a kid, it was ancient American history or what Star Wars characters did, something heroic and distant. But I'm the son of a survivor of how wrong revolutions can go, the nephew of a revolutionary turned counter-revolutionary turned political prisoner. And these days, you're more likely to see revolution on a car ad than anywhere meaningful. Words mean things, we say again and again, but overuse and abuse can wear those meanings down, render them pale parodies of what they once were. And revolution, it seemed, had long since lost its meaning. The Ferguson uprising changed that. The movement for black lives spread from city to city, spurned on by social media and the long pent up feeling that no social movement in recent memory has done anything but tiptoe towards justice. You can't tiptoe towards justice. You can't walk up to the door all polite and knock once or twice hoping someone's home. Justice is a door that when closed must be kicked in. No state, Baldwin wrote, has been able to foresee or prevent the day when their most ruined and abject accomplice or most expensively dressed prostitute will growl this far and no further. And maybe that day is more like a series of days, the whole year of protest that erupted between now and then, a culminating mass of days and nights, bodies laying down in intersections, symphony halls, strip malls, superhighways across this country, stopping traffic and business as usual, declaring by their very presence, no further, and again, no further. I texted you updates as we marched. Still safe and things are mostly calm. We've taken Columbus Circle. Helicopters overhead, but cops can't seem to keep up with us or figure out where we're going next. They couldn't figure out where we were going next because we had no idea where we'd go next. We spun in an impossible, unruly snake through Midtown, spilled out into the streets and then the bridges and throughways. One night we shut down the Manhattan Bridge and pushed deep into Crown Heights, an army of flashing blue lights at our backs. With no coordination, no grant dictating our steps or signs, no leader, we marched in lockstep with hundreds of thousands of protesters across the United States and then the globe and the simple resonating demand that Black Lives Matter laid bare the twin lies of American equality and exceptionalism. Even on the left, even in this age of exposed racial rifts, politicians still say with a straight face that this country was founded on principles of equality. Words mean things we say again and again, but actions mean much more. And still as a nation, we worship the very slave owners we, who gave legal precedence to the notion of percentages of human beings. We scream equality and freedom while unabashedly modeling our actions on the fathers of genocide. The only way to rationalize this most American of contradictions is to devalue the lives of the slaughtered as was done then, so it must be now. And so apologists remind us 
us that those were the times and they didn't know better and on and on. But if those lives matter now, then they mattered then and the clap back stretches through history, unraveling all the creation myths this country has always held most sacred, toppling our many false idols and cleaning out our profaned temples. Thank you. Wow. Uh, Daniel didn't mention it, but that letter that he wrote was for his wife when she was pregnant with their first child. Not no? no. <laughs> Am I wrong? We're going to have kids one day. <laughs> contemplating. But you were contemplating. <laughs> Everybody slow down. Everyone tell us to get her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, let me check. I'm sorry. That's all right. But you know, I, um, <laughs> when Jasmine invited me to write an essay for this anthology, I felt really intimidated because my, my initial concept was to write a letter to my two black children, and they're very little. And if I had undertaken that strategy, I would have been replicating the fire next time insofar as Baldwin undertook that project as a letter. It's a love letter to his nephew who took his name, um, James. But one can't really duplicate Baldwin. And I also didn't know what to say to my children. I couldn't figure it out. And it wasn't until I ran across this mural in my neighborhood. I live up in Washington Heights. Um, maybe we can get this, this one. Uh, know Your Rights mural on 173rd Street that I, that I arrived at the structure um, an idea of how to enter into the essay. It felt like a gift when I ran into this, when I ran across this mural, um, which is a gift for the people in the neighborhood who would pass by it. I'm going to read to you a little bit about the mural and the project that um, that uh, is behind several murals. But I also wanted just to let you know that yesterday I walked by this spot again on my way back from a swimming pool with my kids and it's no longer there. It's been painted over and I don't know why. But I'm glad that I had the opportunity to document it before it disappeared. In the back of our minds that summer of 2015 as an uprising and its violent suppression raged in Missouri, was the problem of when and how to talk to our children about protecting themselves from the police. At what age is such a conversation appropriate? By what age is it critical? How could it not be despairing? And what precisely should be said? My boy was four then, my girl just two. The day was hot. En route to the bridge, we felt no reprieve from the sun, just as we'd felt no relief from the pileup of bad news about blacks being murdered with impunity. When we learned of the terror at AME Emanuel in Charleston, we had not yet recovered from the unlawful death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, nor the shooting of Mike Brown in Ferguson, nor the chokehold death of Eric Garner in Staten Island, nor the shooting of Trayvon Martin in Florida, nor the shooting of Tamir Rice in Cleveland, to name but a few tri triggers of civil unrest. We weren't surprised there were no indictments in these cases, sadly enough, but we were righteously indignant. The deaths seemed to be cascading in rapid succession, each one tripping a live wire, like the feet of Edward Moybridge's galloping horse. The picture we were getting, and not because it was growing worse, but because our technology now exposed it, was clear in mounting evidence of discriminatory systems that don't treat or protect our citizens equally. And escalating dissent was giving rise to a movement that insists what should be evident to everyone, black lives matter. There were hashtag alerts for pop-up protests in malls, die-ins on roads, and other staged acts of civil disobedience, such as disruptions of white people eating their brunch. <laughs> Protesters against police brutality dusted off some slogans from the civil rights era, such as no justice, no peace, but others were au courant. I can't breathe, hands up, don't shoot. White silence is violence, and most poignant to me as a mother is my son next. On our return trip home, I noticed a mural I could have sworn had not been there before. That's this one. Know your rights, the mural trumpeted in capital letters. How had it escaped my attention? 
The artwork covered a brick wall abutting the 24-hour laundromat. I passed every weekday morning on the walk to the children's daycare. A vision of tropical blues, it splashed out from the gritty gray surroundings, creating an illusion of depth. My eyes drank it in. This mural operates like a comic strip in panels marrying image and text. In the first panel, a youngster is carded by a law enforcement official. In the second, a goateed man in a baseball cap is being handcuffed. In the third, a group of citizens stare evenly outward. One of them wears a look of disgust and a t-shirt that says Fourth Amendment, a sly allusion to the part of our Constitution that protects us against unreasonable search and seizure without probable cause. Another holds his cell phone aloft to record what is happening on the street. You have the right to film and observe police activity, the mural states, in Spanish, appropriate for a neighborhood where Spanish is the dominant language and where young men of color are regularly stopped and frisked by the police. In the lower left-hand corner, the Miranda rights are paraphrased in English. My first instinct was to take a picture of the mural so that I could carry it with me in my pocket. I was grateful for it, not only as a thing of beauty on the gallery of the street, but also as a kind of answer to the question that had been troubling us, how to inform our children about the harassment they might face. The mural struck me as an act of love for the people who would pass it by. I understood why it had been made and why it had been made here in the hood next to a laundromat as opposed to on Fifth Avenue next to Tiffany's or Saks. It was armor against the cruelty of the world. It was also a salve to reclaim physical and psychic space. I wondered who had done it. After some internet sleuthing, I discovered the painter was a Chilean artist who goes by the tag name Sekis, and that this mural was the first of several public artworks commissioned by a coalition of grassroots organizations called People's Justice for Community Control and Police Accountability. The other Know Your Rights murals were spread out across four of New York City's five boroughs, excluding Staten Island, where a great number of cops live, <laughs> in poor neighborhoods most plagued by police misconduct. For the rest of that summer and into the fall, I photographed as many of them as I could, like a magpie collecting bright things for her nest. Thank you. Wow, it, each essay, and that was just a snippet really from each of their essays, was so powerful. And um, you know, I, I compared it when we were talking in the back. Uh, if you ever watch like the making of an animated film, and then learn that a lot of times in those animated films, that the voices of those characters were, weren't even in the same room at the same time, but sometimes create this kind of beautiful story and um, this book is that way in so many ways. Like, it sometimes felt, and I, I spent a lot of time reading it this weekend, like all of the writers met and said, what are you writing? No, what are you writing? But that, that's not how it happened at all. It, but it really speaks uh, to um, Jasmine putting together uh, a really gifted and amazing group, and so, I hope again that you not only purchase it, but talk about it and share it on your social networks and, uh, and not just in a vague way, but it would be powerful with your own network, your own Facebook page, if you talk about what specifically connected with you in the book. And don't just provide a random link because that doesn't connect, but share how it connected with you and share your own story. Uh, I had one question and I want to then help facilitate as many of your questions as we can. Uh, and any of you can answer, the, any or all of you can answer this, but where do you see us going next? As, as you've written about where you've been, where we've been, uh, where we are, can you, can you be a fortune teller for a moment? And, and just, even if it's, a, it's just your, your complete guess, uh, where do you see us going from here? And any, any of you can chime in. Set up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I always avoid the future. I, I, that's, I, I, look, I write science fiction and I have no idea. I can't, I can't even. Um, I will say that I take a lot of inspiration and hope 
and this is a time where there's very little hope to be found, I think. But when I do find hope, it's generally in the conversations that are popping off with the young people on online, on social media. Um, I feel like you you can track the change of how conscious uh, folks have become, young folks particularly, you know, just by looking at, uh, you know, what people are talking about over the course of the past six years. And um, it just wasn't like that. Like the level of discourse wasn't there five and six years ago um, on Twitter or on Facebook, you know, and to see that change and to see folks really just, not just being brilliant and political and revolutionary, but just extremely creative too. Um, and hilarious amidst the heartbreak. Mm. Um, I think that's the most hopeful thing that I can think of sure. right now. So I, I see that, you know, gathering steam and momentum as it has been, both in the streets and on Twitter and everywhere else, you know, online. And then furthermore in literature, because I think, you know, the movement around diversifying books has kind of run a parallel track yeah. to the movement for black lives and that's an exciting moment too so film as well film as well yeah, yeah. i mean across the arts so that's that's the kind of future that i want to focus on i know there's a lot of grim stuff ahead too but i believe in the power of art sure go ahead i think one reason why is this working can yeah. you hear me yep. uh that daniel mentioned social media is that we're already moving in a direction of sharing information that um, that has altered the way media works. And we talked about this a little bit in the green room, Sean. Right. Ye yesterday I had the opportunity to go to a really important and interesting exhibit in the Bronx at the Bronx Documentary Center of Citizen Journalism. Not just um, recent citizen journalism, but running uh, back over the, the course of the last century. So it ends with Diamond Reynolds' footage of Philando Castile dying mm. next to her in her car, um, which she records with such composure, knowing that this is the best way uh, she can save him, knowing that she's dying, that yeah. he's dying. Yeah. This is the best way that she can save him. Mm. And that is contrary to her impulse as his lover yeah. to staunch his blood, right? Mm. But she understands the power of the camera. And um, this is not a new thing, but what's new is that all of us have the, the potential to be, to be um, citizen journalists, to be bystanders. And uh, that's what these murals are about, right? You see this guy here. Um, all these murals are about that. You have the right to, you have the right to film uh, police activity and um, the police don't always let you know that. <laughs> um, they might tell you otherwise, but you have, the right, you have the right to as long as you're not interfering with them. And so I think what's happening with Black Lives Matter uh, is a really brilliant strategy of just taking, taking this, this video and jumping over the old media channels so that, you know, Diamond yeah. Phillips footage, it, it was the major, major news story across the world the morning after that happened because she, she live streamed it. Um, so, in other words, I think that the moral outrage we're seeing that has created uprisings, riots um, of the nature that used to be kind of unusual, right, that, that Rodney King in 91 was a landmark event and now these events are happening they, they feel like they're happening constantly it's not that it's not that more black people more black men are dying it's that we have more footage of it and we know how to share it with each other and i think the future is just that the moral outrage um, is going to shift the, the needle and, of the culture um, and i think we're seeing it the future is now i think we're seeing that happening good thoughts Garnet. i mean i'm the guy you asked Chinese or Korean and I can't even tell you what's going to happen in the next five minutes. So I'm nervous about making suggestions about the future. But I'd say this much. When Bowen had begun the fire next time, the introduction that we often race through to get to the chapters, there's this one little telling moment where he's speaking and he's addressing his nephew that he calls Big James, yep. who was named from him. And he's speaking about his relationship with Big James's dad, uh, Baldwin's brother. Uh, and He's, you know, he just makes this quick remark saying, oh, we were trembling in those times. And you know, although we were trembling, you know, we would not have survived you know, had we not loved each other. And so as a way of answering the question poorly, I'll say that in moving forward, if 
or critique or protests or attempts to understand each other are not coming out of love. If we haven't tried to figure out how to live with people we disagree with, live with people who might even abuse us, for example, you know, me and the police, if our attempts at understanding and critique and protests are not wed to love, uh, then it doesn't fare well for us. Mm. So I say that at least going forward, that the one thing that may give us a sense of hope is to root all these things sure. in love. Yeah, yeah, that's good, man. You don't have to. You don't have to chime in if you don't. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I do, because I'm gonna be the one that's out. <laughs> uh, I, I was just thinking. Um, you know, it's it's. Like, uh, I think a lot of the people in this room, are, I, okay, I'm, I'm making pronouncements here, but I, I would gather that um, some of the people in the room, or I'll just speak for myself and I'll speak for Daniel too, because I know him a little bit, uh, <laughs> that you sometimes feel inoculated from this kind of danger, right? And so do the, and I don't even want to talk about the one percenters, because that's like fairyland, but like the 10 percenters, you know, like the people who aren't billionaires, but like make a good living, they feel inoculated from this. And I think, I don't know where we're going to go in the future, but I do know that we have to find a way to make them feel empathy, right? We have to make them be able to see that these are human beings that this is happening to. And when it happens, because when, when I see something, I know that I'm not very far from it. I know that in the wrong alley at the wrong time, it could happen to me. And so, but I think that a lot of people who make the decisions and political decisions on that don't have that same sense of connection. So I would hope someone figures out how to make people who have power feel a deeper sense of connection. Not sympathy, not like, oh my God, there's another one. But like, if that happens to him, it may very well happen to me or someone yeah. I love. Yeah, no, that's good. Great thoughts from all of you. We have time for a few questions, and I'm going to set some quick uh, ground rules. You, because we are on a bit of a schedule, you have to ask quicker questions, and the panelists will give quicker answers than maybe they feel comfortable with. But we want to be able to get to a few of you, and then I'd like for you to be able to spend a few moments um, shaking their hands and meeting them and spending some time with them. So I'll start in the front and work my way back, but I see you. Hello. Um, I, I guess I want to kind of challenge the idea of social media um, being the most effective tool. Hi. So I kind of want to challenge the idea of social media um, for a couple of reasons. I think, yes, it's very effective. I think you're right. Had she not been live streaming what happened, um, it wouldn't have been, I guess, the video heard around the world, right? But with that said, I think there is, in, to some degree, an oversaturation of social media. We're bombarded constantly, um, not only with activism and the things that are happening to our communities, but as well as like everything that's trying to be sold to us, right? So I think, for me, you know, how do we challenge that? that um, as well as honestly like you know you listed about five names of, of, of recent killings Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, so on you know the, that list stretches far longer and, and I'm sure um, you know the people in this room are aware of that so my fear is you know there it's sort of an echo chamber I mean you know to a degree we're preaching to the choir the people present here is the choir um, and you spoke of saying how to reach the people with power um, you know to really have skin in the game because if they're white, they don't have skin in the game, and that's just the reality. Um, you know, how do you get past that echo chamber? Because I can speak to the people here in this room all day, and they're going to agree with me, and that's great. But they're not the ones making the decisions at the end of the day. You did not follow my rules. <laughs> you, 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 com you completely disrespected everything I said there. And you didn't even, you didn't even ask a question. Didn't even ask a question. It was kind of a question she, she did. She mark came in with a question at the end there, there. but I, I get it. Yeah, and I, I have some thoughts. I'll, I'll reply as well, and then we'll see. Daniel, you have something, Daniel? I'm, I make light in love, right? That's all I'm doing. I would just say um, it's true. It's not enough. I don't think there's one answer. You know what I mean? I think social media has allowed conversations and voices to rise up unfiltered in a way that they haven't before and that does come with a lot of problems on multiple levels so I don't think we can just be like well social media all right we're good you know definitely not that um, I will say as a writer um, I know that I'm able to 
to talk to readers um, that I, in a way I never would have been able to before. And I see folks, you know, having global conversations now about patriarchy, about anti-blackness, about police murders. And so, you know, that's the net benefit. And there's definitely um, a saturation problem. And there's definitely a problem of people just, and there's a problem of creating, you know, these cycles and these loops of just the performance of black death that happens on the newscast and on our Twitter yeah. feeds over and over and over. Um, and I think a lot of it is about finding the balance. So like, you know, some folks are going to be in the streets. Some folks can't be in the streets. And some folks, you know, don't feel safe in the streets. So they need to be, you know, on their feeds or writing books. Um, but I would challenge you on the notion of echo chamber. I think that power is, you know, super complex, which I don't think you're saying it's simple. But um, we're always talking to people that at any moment, you know, can be in power and can be empowered to either make change or further our oppression on multiple levels. You know, whether it's because they're writers or because they have huge followings on social media or because they're publishers or because they're cops or they're friends with cops. Like, I, I don't think there's sort of like people over there that are in power and then we're over here. It's, 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 there's so much to it. But I take your challenge and I think you're absolutely right that there needs to be a lot more than just social media. Sure. I'm going to obey your rule and keep it short. Um, it's a perennial question, how to get people to care for things that they should care about, and it seems that they don't. Um, actually, it might even be the eternal question. And social media is one way, um, and what we're doing is another way, um, which is hardly different from what you're doing. We're doing it in print, but we're actually having conversations. And so one suggestion is to have conversations in good faith. In other words, speak in order for us write as if you actually do believe that people will listen. Not write them off before you've even given them a chance. So when I write, I don't assume that people in power will not pay attention. I write in assuming that we're all capable of understanding and empathy and love and compassion. Um, in and also in a right, in answering that the real division splits right onto the center of each of us. It's not so much or they're the wealthy in and the non-wealthy or black and white is that we're all capable of compassion we're all capable of injustice we're all capable of in any manner of things that degrade us or uplift us so i write in good faith in assuming that i can get through to you and find in ways of contact in ways of believing that conversation is possible so you know writing is one way and for those who are not writers you know we're all assume everybody here in speaks and so to have conversation with that assuming that you know you can get past differences and not speak in bad faith sure i i get this i definitely get the spirit of what you're saying and i agree without equivocation that social media is not enough and, and like if i summarized what you said with those words social media is i agree with you it's absolutely not enough but i do want to my, my pushback is I want to defend preaching to the choir. One, because I'm religious and even Baldwin had a, had a religious background that sometimes the choir needs to be preached to and motivated and inspired and understand like sometimes the choir needs to be touched and like I used, I don't sing but when I was a young Christian I used to go to a choir rehearsal and there was this powerful moment at the end of the choir rehearsal where we would all hold hands and pray. But I, I felt more power from the hand holding than I did the prayer. It was just something about it, just the physical touch and connection. Like to me, like when I look out and see these rows and see the choir, it motivates me, it inspires me. And I hope that for those of you that, this is the choir, right? This is the choir. But most of us probably don't know each other um like if we chose to right here right now if we chose to create a, a super pack from this group <laughs> right or just an email list or whatever like it, like there's power in this in this choir right here just right here and the truth is like the people in this room are about the size of most crowds in most church basements in the 60s. It looked about like this or less. And so it, it, you, do, you should preach to the choir and then add a few people to it, right? Bring a few people along. That, I, I see it in a couple of different ways. But it, 
It can't just be on social media, I get it. Sir, I see you, but I'm gonna hop all the way to the back. What's your name, man? Okay, he's gonna bring you a microphone right here. And then, uh, sir, uh, then we'll come to you next, okay? And then I think we have time for um, these two and maybe one more. So just, I'm sorry, so quickly with James Baldwin's legacy as a writer, and there's so many people who try to replicate what he does, and they don't see what he couldn't do. So I wanna know as, as writers how each of you have tried to figure out ways to push forth, push forward his legacy by not wasting time doing what he did, and how do you look at what he didn't do and try to further that? Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> you want somebody to hate on Baldwin? <laughs> Come on, family. <laughs> For real? Uh, I was looking at a, uh, uh, what is it? On um, being white and other lies. Is that it? Mm -hmm. And um, and Baldwin says that um, no, I'm paraphrasing, but no one was white before they got here. He talks about when the Irish got here, and yeah. uh, and so I've been kind of interrogating that, and that's not true. Right. That whiteness was being developed in Europe long before the people came to America, and so. Um, I think in that there's something to explore because if Baldwin held that belief and he wrote that essay in like 1984, that was pretty close to when he died, then there's, there's, a, there's a gap, there's a chasm there that someone can, can explore. And um, I don't know exactly where t to take that, um, but I do think there's, you know, we see Baldwin as a god and when you die you get to become God, but he definitely was a human being and so there are some things that we can advance. One of the remarkable things about Baldwin was time and again how he asked, well, he wrote so he could see what it was like to be in his shoes or in the shoes of people who are black. But he continually reminded, I mean, he sits through the fire this time over and over again, you know, our responsibility to always be putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Yeah. Those he was speaking to, he was speaking about, or sometimes even in a speaking against. And so, at least with Baldwin, the way it, he has shaped my writings time and again and again and again the responsibility to always be compassionate. But also the reminder that compassion doesn't preclude criticism. Mm -hmm. That you know, he's criticizing because he does care. Rather than say what Baldwin didn't do, I'd say there are ways in which Baldwin couldn't anticipate certain current realities. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, so much of Baldwin's writing in you know, are about, uh, at least the fire next time, in you know, a black and white. But I mean, you know, just walk into Jackson Heights and you recognize that there are realities in Jackson Heights or in Flushing or in Crown Heights, um, that there are realities that while we might have anticipated but didn't fully you know, encompass because of just the very different demographics and the different situations. So there's a way in which we're in a more pluralistic world and that basic question Warren is asking, how do we live with differences? In a, it's a question I'm asking again, but asking in a certain, in a demographic um, reality that, you know, is different from his. Um, he's writing this is what six to three, the fine next time. Yep. We're living in a post six to five, post U.S. Immigration Act world, where all men of different cultures have exploded upon our shores. And so, at least in my writing, at least in this essay, I'm trying to ask, what does it mean to be a Black Jamaican living in the U.S. and what are ways in which there are deep overlaps in the way like me and Mitchell. In a, in a, in for example, but all the differences that may make me particularly Jamaican, so ways of you know, anticipating and dealing with this world that are different. So in other words, I've extended it more to a pluralistic age um, that Baldwin couldn't fully anticipate, even though he hinted at. Uh, this is a short answer, but another thing Baldwin wasn't was funny. He wasn't <laughs> funny. <laughs> and I... Uh. Um, he was also not a, not a gifted poet. <laughs> but I think <laughs> you're asking, you know, what couldn't he do that somebody needs to do? You know, maybe he couldn't afford to be. I think he, I think mm. he actually was, was very witty and, and quite capable of humor. You see him in interviews, he, he is very yeah. funny. Yeah. But the writing, and I'm not saying it's self-serious, but it is serious, it is serious work. <laughs> And I think there is a way that humor mm. really, really connects with people. Oh. 
M. Baldwin was extremely gifted at explaining black experience to white people, and that was an important, important thing he, he did to move people's hearts. Um, but I think there is another kind of writing and another kind of you know, performing um, that is really powerful when it talks about serious things in a way that is, that is humorous. Mm. Yeah, all, all, all of the above. And um, I, you know, I just I feel like the writer's job in a lot of ways, and that's a very Baldwin way to start a sentence, right? <laughs> but the writer's job is to speak exactly to the time that we live in. And um, he did it so well that he's still speaking to the time we live in now. Right. And that's part of his genius, and that's part of why your question is kind of impossible. But it's also such a great question, because there are actually, I do think, as, as y'all were talking, there are a lot of ways, um, you know, as much as he was all-encompassing, there is still so much to talk about. Um, and certainly, I think gentrification is a huge piece of something that's happening right now that w just wasn't happening in that way at that time. Um, but also just gender. You know, Baldwin, I haven't read all of Baldwin, and I intend to never read all of Baldwin because I always want to be able to turn to something new from Baldwin when I'm lost. <laughs> so there's that. So I can't say that he never spoke on it, but the, the, the where the gender analysis and feminism is right now is so many light years from where it was then. Um, and, I, you know, to, to really get into questions of that, I couldn't find that in Baldwin. I had to turn to Bell Hooks um, and to Audre Lorde and to mm -hmm. Beyonce mm -hmm. and, <laughs> you know, to find what that meant <laughs> to, to be a man and to understand masculinity and patriarchy and all this other shit. So, you know, I, I think that's a place we always need to be clear and, and honest about and figure out, you know, what comes next as far as uh, our analysis and our, and our poetry. And by poetry, I mean essays. Good. Sir, if you put your hand back up, we'll bring the mic to you. Yeah, and, and, and my thought on that is, you know, there, there's this, this tendency that bothers me to label one person as today's Baldwin, right? And like, so today's Baldwin is Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I, and I see that, and people, that's what people say. And, you know, any of us can aspire to, to be whoever it is that we want to be, and so, I think there's a part of me that pushes back on, like, who is today's MLK? Who is today's Baldwin? Who is today's Malcolm X? And, and, and then try to find that one person and then limit that role to that one person when that was never their intent in the first place, if, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sean, Sean my question to you is, uh, do you agree with what I'm about to say? Uh, Don't come with any foolishness. No, that's, that's just a little New York joke for you. Uh, <laughs> here's the question. Yes, sir. The racial divide in our country has a history of hundreds of years. We all know this. Um, where might it be possible to begin to build a bridge to begin to lessen that divide? I, I don't know the answer to that question. It's just the question, because uh, it's, being, it's, it's a question that's been asked for a long time. Uh, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, when that was passed in the 65 and 64, it eliminated the Jim Crow legal structure, concrete specific. Uh, our task and the task of building that bridge in, in some ways is much more difficult because it's about going inside people's hearts, their own personal history, their psychology, the history of the country, the fear of the other, I don't know, the, the hatred that's there. But I, that, that idea of the bridge, you began to talk about it a little bit in your previous answers, uh, although you didn't use the word bridge, but that's the question I'm asking. Where and how might it be possible? What would we need to do? What are some examples of beginning to build that bridge? to folks on the other side who will listen to us, like that police captain who, who uh, was, uh, was able to resolve the dynamics that uh, the brother up there was going through in his example. He might be somebody you can talk to. I got it, yeah, I see, right? I see, yeah, I see exactly where you're going with that. Okay, I, thank you. I have, yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree with your sentiment that those bridges are difficult to build, right? But at first, I didn't, know, I didn't know what bridge you were talking about. And then at the end, you alluded to, like, maybe a bridge between 
like protesters and police. Um, each of those bridges are very different. Bridges between generations, for instance. Very difficult. Like there are deep generational gaps in this current movement that we're in. But for every gap, you have uh, Harry Belafonte, who says, no, I, I want to make sure that there are bridges there. We have someone like yourself who shows up and says, hey, I want to somehow, somehow be a part of this conversation. And so each, and then, you know, we have bridges between gender, bridges between uh, ethnicities. But I'll just address that bridge between police and protester. Because those relationships are deeply frayed, and uh, particularly here in New York, like Commissioner Bratton just was on television a few days ago, basically giving a big middle finger to protesters on his way out. And uh, it confirmed for me, as I just moved to New York less than two weeks ago, that he was who I thought he was. And I realized that he had been viewing protest through the lens of a giant fuck you, basically. And he confirmed it in this, this kind of off-the-cuff conversation. He had, I was actually watching it live when he was on, what is that, Channel One? Uh, what do you call that? Yeah. New York One? <laughs> Fresh. There are some examples of police officers and police captains and chiefs around the country who aren't approaching conversations like that. But New York is not a great model for positive relationships between police and protester. Uh, the city of Charlotte is a good model. There's this viral, I'm gonna post it. If you go to my Facebook page in a couple of hours, there's a viral video of Charlotte's police chief, a black man talking about how he polices every day through the lens of the brutality he has experienced. And it came just days after the officers were shot and killed in Dallas. And um, I know several people there in Charlotte still have deep problems with the police, but they have in him somebody who is approachable, who's realistic, who's honest about the problems. Um, in St. Louis, for instance, there are, there's a black police union and a white police union. And I've written about this many times, and the black police union has been calling for the resignation of their white police chief for several months. And they've done that at their own peril, the risk of their own safety. Uh, but it has started to cause other black police officers around the country and other righteous police officers around the country to start to speak up and speak out. I put the burden back on police and because protesters vary wildly from fierce and angry to soft and receptive. Police not so much, not on the discussion level. And so uh, there is a, there's a serious burden and, and need for police officers to be bridge builders I think you'd find protesters much more willing to do so if they thought police officers were sincere in their, in their willingness to, to build that bridge. Well, we only have time for one last question. I, I apologize. And uh, back, back here in the back, I thought I saw someone. Do you still have, yeah, right there, there you go, yep. Uh, and then any other questions you have, you can ask any of us as soon as we close uh, one to one and we'll, each of us can stay for as long as we can. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm going to begin with a statement, and I'm sorry I'm going to break your <laughs> rules as well. Sure. Um, one of the biggest cultural phenomena, I think, in the United States, as someone who is not from here and who had to learn what it means to be black mm. in here, is that people do not believe black people. Mm. And that is evidenced in, from police brutality to literature to friendships. And so I want to know from the writer's perspective, what can individuals and, and societies and institutions do to correct that cultural problem? Wow. Uh, I, ha I have some thoughts, but uh, Mitchell, Garnet, I don't know. Uh, 
<laughs> Where's the ho homie in the back? I can't see him. The one, the guy that asked the question before, oh, yeah, uh, he grounded his um, question. He's like, "What can we do to bridge the racial divide?" That's what he said, right? Something like that. Yeah, Something it was race <laughs> in there, and I think one of the things that we can do is deconstruct this idea, this myth, this hocus pocus. Because um, if you if you're grounding it in something that's constructed and not real then I don't I don't think that that's the place to start is to say where can how can we bridge the racial divide the racial divide does not exist um, and I think that maybe one of the things that we can do is start to teach you know we I remember how I had social studies class when I was I went to a real bad high school y'all probably was an AP class but I ain't had none of that <laughs> um, but but they never told me about race in high school or elementary school or middle school um, I had to pay $100,000 NYU to even find out about it. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I also think that it, had we been giving that information to children when they're developing their sense of identity, like that's the real place. Like to get a 60-year-old dude and tell him race is hocus pocus and you're not white and I'm not black and figure it out from there is probably not going to happen, but maybe we catch a generation or two back and, uh, and try to uh, educate them. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that sentiment. Uh, I mean, yes, Garner. Um, where are the people with the easy questions tonight? <laughs> right, right, right. That was that. That's a curveball. That last one. I mean, I'm still thinking. My friends that. failed me. You're supposed to step up and ask my name. It's supposed to be easy. <laughs> but to answer your question. Um, and by way of answering your question, partially giving an answer to the gentleman's question before. But one way, and at least I know one way that the four of us are grappling with, is by bearing witness through writing. That, and writing that one affirms our common humanity. So that's one way to possibly get past some kind of bridge or division, just to find ways of touching on our common humanity in a way that I hope that somebody will go, ah, me too. And suddenly, it's very easy to say us versus them when you find ways to degrade them, to believe that them are you know, less than you, that you don't have you know, these deep chords of connection, that you know, you know, them are you know, violent and ignorant and stupid and less than human in some ways. So to write in a way that affirms the common humanity and bears witness, knowing that a lot of people will ignore it, but it will get through here and there. But also in doing that, to also bear witness to the full experience that one goes through. So someone is reading and saying, oh, you know, like for instance, the thing I did in walking, you know, we can all identify the joys of walking and walking is this marvelous thing that, you know, especially in New York, you know, you know, half of the joy of walking in New York is to walk aimlessly, to just shoot down the street because you hear a certain particular tune or you smell a particular scent, you know, jerk chicken always works. Um, yes. And you know, and so to walk aimlessly, to walk spontaneously, to walk with abandon. And there's this long, rich tradition of writing, you know, you know Whitman and Melville and Vivian Gornick and so many others. But then suddenly you start asking, where are all these black writers talking about the joys of walking aimlessly? And then you look at James Weldon Johnson talking about walking aimlessly and bump into a riot in which he was running for his life. And so suddenly people are reading about their common humanity and go, oh, we love walking. Of course those are the joys of walking in New York. And then for me to say, well, I can't really walk aimlessly because an unpredictable black guy walking is an erratic black guy walking, is NPD, NYPD coming, and so suddenly walking becomes this embattled in a, in a practice. Mm -hmm. And so to, in a, and then suddenly to bear witness, or to even that part where it said, I'd prefer to be stopped by the you know, police officers in front of people who were white because I felt that I was treated differently. It also makes you think that sometimes people will say, oh, we don't believe, I mean, there is the thing of continually with the frustration of saying, oh, this happened to me, and someone said, oh, that doesn't make sense, that never happens to me. I'm like, well, that's true, it never happens to you. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened to me. But also, there's a, I believe firmly that the police officers behave so differently in front of black witnesses and white witnesses that there are times when somebody who's white saying, oh, I don't believe you, can say, well, that's because the cops never do that in front of them. The cop is more careful to behave right. more circumspect in, in, in their presence. 
And so writing to you know, give an account of the full broad range of human experience and people can see the common humanity and they see the places in which it departs and there is two tears may, may, and my hope is and may bring others to understand you know, bear witness to that experience. And then there's the other simple thing of saying to someone, there are other ways that the world is in you know, a terror. Just you know, say to your friends who are women, said, you know what it's like to walk the road as a woman. It's very different as a man. You know, just like you know, you have to be on high alert the way a lot of black men have to be on high alert. You have to be continually dealing with this unwelcome gaze and guys who you know somehow think that you're there to smile for them. Why are you not smiling? Which is more a command than a question. You know, or guys who are like. Baby, let me holler at you, because that has really worked. Women really respond to that, and you've gotten a lot of dates like that. <laughs> and so sometimes invite others to join you in these you know, experiences or you know, touch on different things that are in some ways a bridge to saying, well, if you know what it's like you know, to be a woman, either hyper-visible or invisible, you know, there are ways in the black experiences very much like that and find these bridges in a, into it. But again, just not feeling a conversation should end and shut it down like that. And I do know the frustration where I said, oh, you know, you know I was running and the cops just stopped me and did that to me. People like, that doesn't make sense. I run all the time. The cops never stop me. Well. That's, yeah, be a beautiful answer, actually, and just uh, so, so thoughtful. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end us on, on that note. Um, in a second, I'd like for you to stand up and give them a round of applause. But, or you can do it now. That's great. Yeah, do it now. Uh, they definitely deserve it.